This is Duke University. They're exempt from FOIA. A lot of contractor documents are exempt from FOIA. So you can't, you can't get access. Good afternoon. My name is Craig's father. <laughs> when, uh, when Charlie uh, became the executive director of our center last summer, and we talked about this conference, I told him that I wanted to have uh, an absolute minimal role because this is his conference. I spent 17 years putting these things on so he can start his run. But uh, one of the things I did ask is the opportunity to introduce to you our Saturday luncheon speaker. Will Gunn is the general counsel of the Veterans Affairs Department and has been in that position since May of 2009. So coming up on, on three years, Will. He graduated from the Air Force Academy with military honors in 1980 and Harvard Law School cum laude in 1986. He has a Master's of Law degree in Environmental Law from the George Washington University and another Master of Science degree in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Will had a distinguished, and I truly mean that, a distinguished 25-year career in the United States Air Force, virtually all of it as a judge advocate. He, he had only been an Air Force officer for 10 years when he was selected to be a White House fellow. And I think all, all those of you who are wearing the uniform know that that's an extremely competitive selection. Um, his last assignment prior to retiring in 2006 was as the first chief defense counsel for the Office of Military Commissions that handles all the Guantanamo Bay trials. Matter of fact, I asked Will to come down here in 2004 while he was still wearing the uniform to talk about what he was doing. That's about the same time that John Altenberg went in as the convening authority for military commissions. Uh, and, and things started to happen in a tremendous challenge for Will, setting not only the pace as a defense counsel, but as you're here today also establishing the values of those who would be working in the trials at Guantanamo Bay, whether they be defense counsel or trial counsel prosecutors or military judges. After retiring in 2006, Will was named the president and CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington, uh, one of the largest affiliates of the Boys and Girls Clubs anywhere. And then in, in 2008, he founded the Gun Law Firm for, for a very specific purpose, is to provide legal support and advice to veterans. The veterans. And, and so it was no surprise to me that the very next year, Will ended up becoming the general counsel of the Veterans Department, the Veterans Affairs Department. Now, uh, if I were to go through his entire curriculum vitae, uh, we, I would be wasting his time. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, I do want to suggest to you that Will, and, and I mean this very personally, Will, you, you are one of the most accomplished attorneys. Uh, that I know, and it is a tremendous personal privilege and pleasure to give you the podium in this conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, in, in particular, Scott and, and Will, and you, Charlie. Greatly appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share this afternoon. I'm, I'm going to do my best to leave some time for, for questions. I've been inspired uh, since, since I've been here. I was reflecting as, as I walked into this room yes, yesterday, uh, Scott, that the, uh, is this the same room that I was in? Same, same room. So deja vu, my last time at Duke uh, in 2004, I was uh, wearing uniform and uh, making a presentation on my role as, as chief defense counsel. And so when, when I came in, I was, I was just going to talk about VA, but because of where, where I am, almost the exact same spot, and particularly after listening to yesterday's presentations and hearing a discussion about Hamdan, and Hamdi, Rasul, Boumediene, and all of this, I said I, I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk just a little bit about military commissions. But before I do that, let me, let me do this. About three weeks ago, I, I think it was the 24th of uh, March, 
I, I, I pulled out information about this conference and, and I went to see Al Gill. Al Gill is a retired uh, Army officer who serves as uh, my boss's principal speechwriter. And, um, and we never spent very much time together, but I, I see his work all, 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 all the time. And so I went to see Al and I said, you know, Al, here's this conference. And, and they say as the theme, after Afghanistan, where to from here? And you know, Al, I, I have this idea. I've seen this quote by George Washington that talks about the importance of treating veterans well. And I believe that I can make a cogent argument that it is absolutely critical to this nation's security that we take care of our veterans. And, and, and the quote that I was talking about is, is one that, that goes like this. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. Those are great words, and they're attributed to George Washington, father of this country. Al told me that the only problem is that he researched those words and could find no proof <laughs> that George Washington ever spoke those words. You know, that's a Nostradamus-like statement. Even better, it's precise. But speechwriter couldn't prove it, but I shared it anyway, <laughs> despite what he, what he had to say. Let, let me give you some context for, for what I want to talk about today. Uh, Phil Carter in the last presentation said that there were two and a half million people in uniform. Well, right now there are about 22 million veterans of this nation. The Civil War ended in 1865, 157 years ago. The Department of Veterans Affairs is paying benefits to two direct descendants of the United States Civil War. The war ended 157 years ago. Think 2170. After Afghanistan, where do we go to from here? We will be paying the cost for more than a century to come as a result of our involvement in the current war. Earlier this week, I was listening to news reports about a earthquake off the coast of in Indonesia and in talking about the tsunami warning system. Well, there's a wave coming. The wars may be winding down, but there's a wave coming. As DOD focuses on reducing its costs, we're in the early, very early stages of what is going to happen from a veteran's perspective. I'll talk more about that later on. But I was inspired last night, and like other folks, uh, I just want to thank you, General Hayden, for your, your remarks. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. And the insights that, that you shared when you talked about new threats, old structures, and constant values, that, that, was, that was powerful. For, for me, I, in, in the work that I do, not only now, but in the work that I've had an opportunity to do, I, I really believe that values matter, that they matter a whole lot. And so let me, let me back, back up a little bit, because what I'd like to do in the, in the few minutes that I have is share some stories with you all. Let me start off with my first Afghanistan story. September 11th, 2001, I'm a student at ICAF, Industrial College of the Armed Forces, Fort McNair. From my vantage point, one of the most beautiful spots in DC, the intersection of the Anacostia River and the Potomac, and you look down one, one direction and you can see the Washington Monument, you can see the Capitol, and you look over and you see Haynes Point, 
absolutely beautiful spot. And the school is giving you, giving students that have an opportunity to attend ICAF or National War College, an opportunity to reflect on the big picture for a year. I've been in school for about a month when the attacks came. I can remember being in a military history class and my instructor, we were doing a small group project and our instructor comes into the room and he said, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Okay, stopped for a moment, thought about that. But planes have hit big buildings before. That's interesting. We went back to our work. A few minutes later, of course, he walked back into the room and he said that a second plane had hit the World Trade Center. Only it's a jet. And so was the first. And so, of course, as in many places, all work stopped. And the focus had changed. And we realized that all of a sudden, we were at war. September 11th, 2001. School changed, but the focus of my year in school changed tremendously. They told us at ICAF that coming in as, as a student, this school, this curriculum really isn't designed for your next job, because most of the people there were lieutenant colonels or very junior colonels, and the civilians were uh, GS-14s and 15s who hoped to serve in the senior executive service. They said, this curriculum isn't designed for that. We are here to prepare you for perhaps the assignment after that, or even the assignment after that. Positions in which you will have truly strategic responsibilities. Responsibilities and duties that are characterized by VUCA. VUCA, V-U-C-A, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I reflected on that and those lessons came to serve me well. Fast forward, May 2002. I'm on international travel. At ICAF, you get to choose a, a industry to study. And so I thought about the responsibilities that I would have coming up, and I chose the one that I thought would benefit, benefit me the most. I chose agribusiness. Actually, the reason I chose agribusiness was they had the best trip from my perspective. <laughs> you got to spend one week in Cape Town and one week in Buenos Aires. The only trip that offered the opportunity to see two continents that I wanted to see more of. I'm in Buenos Aires. The Argentine economy had gone through a great deal of turmoil just a few months before. They had been pegged one to one to the dollar. The Argentine currency was now selling three to one for the dollar, but the prices had not changed, so it was great shopping. I had my shopping list, courtesy of my wife. After a day of going out and, and visiting farms and visiting uh, some of the Argentine in industry, I went to check my email and I'm at an uh, internet cafe, and I found an e email from an Air Force technical sergeant who said that uh, someone that John Altenberg knows well, that Whit Cobb was trying to reach me. Whit Cobb was a deputy general counsel in the Department of Defense. And the email simply said that Mr. Cobb wanted to interview uh, me to become the chief defense counsel. I had absolutely no idea what this person was talking about. You see, my last job had been as a chief circuit defense counsel for the Air Force, what the Army calls a chief regional counsel. When I left that job in San Antonio, Texas in, in, 19, in 2001, I figured my duties as a defense counsel were, were gone. Not only that, the Judge Advocate General at the time had offered me the opportunity to come in to serve as his executive officer. I was a student in senior service school, about to go off to 
uh, to become the exec in the front office. I'm thinking I'm living large. All of a sudden, my world changes. So I responded that I was out of the country and that I explained when I'd be back, got another email not long after that telling me that they want to talk to me as soon as I got off the plane. I called the front office for Air Force JAG, spoke to the Deputy Judge Advocate General, at that time Major General Jack Rives, and asked him what was, go what was going on. And he explained to me that the Judge Advocate General at the time had put my name in for this position. And I wanted to know what I had done wrong. <laughs> I'm serious. How is it that I go, I go from being the next exec to being asked to represent Al-Qaeda? <laughs> and folks, I'll be quite honest with you. I didn't think, I, I, I didn't foresee how representing Al-Qaeda was going to help my career prospects. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get it. In fact, when I got back to the States, found out that uh, the interview had been postponed. Mr. Cobb had some things that came up on his schedule, and so it was going to be a while before I got a chance to see him. I was so thankful. What that gave me an opportunity to do was to talk to a lot of people that that I loved and respected. And I started to get advice falling just squarely in two camps. The one camp was run away from it as fast as you possibly can because they're asking you do, to do a no-win job. The other camp was those people that said, I don't know. <laughs> That was what I faced. <laughs> One of the things that's very important to me is, is my faith, though. And years ago, I had an opportunity to, to write a short paper after some events in my life uh, occurred. And the paper was called The Lord and the Assignment Process. <laughs> I went back and I reread The Lord and the Assignment Process. And it talked about one fundamental issue, and that was trust. Trust. And so I went for that first interview, especially I talked to the Judge Advocate General. I got some background on how he thought that my background made me somebody that could do the job. But he told me, hey, look, I still want you to serve as my exec. And not only that, I want you, I don't want you to, if you were selected for this job, I don't want you to stay in the job long. I was thankful <laughs> for that. And uh, and he explained to me that the, judge, that the DOD general counsel at the time, a guy by the name of Jim Haynes, that he'd had some, some dealings with him, and he'd said that they'd nominated an Air Force colonel for a position, and that colonel had gone into the interview and said, essentially, I don't know why, you, why I'm here because I'm not interested in the job. And so the feedback that the judge advocate general had gotten from the general counsel was that if you nominate someone please make sure that it's a legitimate candidate. And he told me that, you know, even with that, after we talked about it and I talked about, you know, well, sir, I, I appreciate the confidence that you have in nominating me, but I could be selected. And, you know, there are people, there are some people that wouldn't be able to understand that. And so that's the only thing that really con concerns me. If I'm selected, I'll do the job well. He said, well, I, I understand, I know how you feel but if you are, if you're uncomfortable with the job, I would have no problem with you going in and letting them know that you're not a volunteer. <laughs> a character test. <laughs> I said, well, sir, I can't do that. They're deploying people. They're putting people in harm's way. That's what this nation, that's what we're about in the military. So I can't do that, but I appreciate you saying that, and I appreciate the fact that you'd still want me to serve as exec. So I went to that interview, 
sat down with Mr. Cobb after various pleasantries and such. There came a point in the interview where he asked me, so are you a volunteer for this position? I've seen image and I've heard it. You've heard it too. They say that when a person is drowning, their whole life flashes before their eyes. <laughs> my whole career flashed before my eyes. Wow, how do I answer this question? And I answered and I said, you know, I think that based upon my experience and such that I could do this job and I could do this job well. But this isn't the last thing that I want to do in the Air Force. <laughs> so if I'm selected, I don't want to be in the job long. He thanked me for that. The interview concluded and he asked me about my schedule, said that this process was on a fast track, that things had been languishing for a while, but commissions could be starting at any moment. John, does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> commissions could start any time now. And so nine months later, I was offered the job of acting chief defense counsel. They put me in a, a ground floor office in the Pentagon next to the wedge that had been damaged on September 11. And each day I had an opportunity, the first thing I had to do was make my recommendations for a staff based upon the nominations I received from the various judge advocate general. In addition to that, I was, I was in this job, in this wedge, and the area that I was in was due for to be uh, demolished and, and rebuilt. This was an area I found out that the people that had been in this area before were people that the Army TJAG, Walt Huffman, I believe, at, at the time, or was it Romick? I'm, I'm not sure who was in the job at that time, had sent, established a team to develop rules for military commissions before the general counsel decided that they were going to bring that in-house and do all of that work within the, the political structure. But each day I had an opportunity to work, to walk to the new wing. And each day I would pass by a quote on the wall from President Bush, words that he spoke to the nation on the night of September 11th. And the words were, terrorists can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings but they cannot touch the foundation of America. Wow. Terrorists can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. I got a chance to meditate on those words. And then when I got down to Guantanamo, they had established a motto. And the motto for the Joint Task Force Guantanamo was, Honor bound to defend freedom. Honor bound to defend freedom. I meditated on those words. Fast forward. I've been in the job for about a year. Things weren't going very fast. Found out military commissions weren't right around the corner. But members of my team came to me, and I had a fantastic team, joint team, great officers great courageous lawyers, and they represented the detainees. One of those folks, of course, Navy Lieutenant Commander Charlie Swift, represented Hamdan, sued the president. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> they came to me and said, hey, sir, Supreme Court has granted cert in Rasul. And we believe that this case, it, it, this is a case where the detainees uh, are challenging their ability, their denial of, of uh, habeas co uh, corpus, and they want to be able to challenge their, their case in court. And so they came to me, and they said they wanted to file an am amicus brief. I knew that my handlers in the Pentagon wouldn't be very excited about members of my team filing an amicus brief at that point. Rather than being considered as defense counsel, because since none of them had clients, they saw themselves, they saw these folks as staff attorneys in the office of the chief defense counsel. Nevertheless, I invited them to come in, make their presentation, and they did. They made the presentation as to why they should be able to make 
to file this brief. At the end of the meeting with them and their attorney, uh, Professor Neil Keitel, who went on to become the, uh, the lead counsel in, in Hamdan, as well as the deputy solicitor general at the beginning of this administration, I was convinced that, yes, it makes sense for these folks to file this brief. And so I went up. I took a letter from them and made the case as to at requesting permission. And I felt like uh, I don't, it reminded me of my early days at the Air Force Academy as a fourth classman. But that's what we get paid for. That's why I was in the job. We eventually got uh, permission, and our folk went forward. I'll just share one last thing about that. I think it was General Scott Black, uh, Army General, came over to do a promotion ceremony for one of my folks, Army Colonel uh, Mark Bridges. And he shared a quote during that that really put things into context. And the quote is by somebody by the name of Ambrose Redmoon. And that's a pseudonym, but Red Moon supposedly said this, courage is not the absence of fear, but the belief that something else is more important than that fear. For me, that became other words to meditate on and to keep in mind as we went forward. But things turned out OK. I'm the general counsel in the Department of Veterans Affairs. <laughs> And I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm thankful for the fact that I love my job. I'm thankful for the fact that I work for a great American, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Eric K. Shinseki. And yeah, I'd be happy to share with you all how this all came to be. But I, I, as I talk about people, I talk to people about the importance of relationships. I talk about how I got here to North Carolina at, as the SGA at Pope in 1996. And as I told Craig earlier, Scott Silliman adopted me. <laughs> it made me feel like I was a part of the Center, to fa center family and a part of the, the Duke family and made me welcome, gave me opportunities to come down here, serve on panels, participate in this conference and in others, and it was a great blessing to me. I, t I, thought, I thought about the, the fact that uh, I was asking Charlie when he was at National War College, because I don't know if he remembers, but we met in 1992 at Fort McNair uh, in the Air Operations Building, when, or actually at Andrews, and, um, and that was 20 years ago. And our paths didn't cross a whole lot on active duty, but they did cross. And my being in the position where I am to make a difference with respect to veterans policy and to direct one of the government's largest legal teams is a direct result of relationships and passion. But let me share this story. When I got through the, the gauntlet of, of interviews and it was time to meet Secretary Shinseki, I guess, for a, a chemistry check, it was an interesting interview. It was unlike any interview that I'd had because essentially the interview lasted for about a half hour. And he spoke for about 27 minutes. <laughs> Essentially, he only had two questions for me. The first question was, after a long buildup, was, do you love veterans? I assured him that I did. And the second question was whether or not I was willing to have him submit my name to the White House for, as a nominee, as a prospective nominee. And I'm thankful for the opportunity that I've had over the last three years. When the secretary came to VA, he came in with a mandate, and that mandate was to transform VA and to make it into a 21st century organization, one that was people-centric, forward-looking, and results-oriented. The secretary Shinseki often says that I can't solve a problem that I can't see, that I can't measure. And so there's a lot of emphasis on trying to measure things. He talks about a fundamental dilemma that we have, and it's a dilemma of two contrasting images. It's an image of that gun-ho high school or college student or graduate 
who's excited about the military, who, who wants to come in and do great things. And this person is just super motivated. But then there's a contrasting image of someone who comes out of the military who is all too frequently the, a victim of depression, post-traumatic stress, TBI, joblessness, homelessness. Our job is essentially to resolve these two contrasting images because they're the same people. Let me explain. While I was an SGA at Pope, I had an opportunity to, to do some recruiting. I, I, I loved recruiting, and, and uh, I believe it was in 1997, I was sent up to New York City to recruit at a BALSA, Black Law Students Association, job fair. And while I was there, at the end of the day, after being there and talking to a lot of students, I had a young lady come in, and she was from West Africa. Had been a, she was now a citizen, but in law school, at, at Rutgers, uh, in the evening program. And, you know, we, we talked. She wanted to talk about Air Force JAG, and she was, she convinced me. It may have been a sales job, but she convinced me that she wanted to serve this country as a judge advocate. And so she adopted me as her mentor, as her coach, as her guide. You know, a lot of people get your cards, but those that are serious are the ones that follow up. Even perhaps when you may want to pull away, they keep following up. <laughs> well, mentoring is one of the things that I do. It's one of the reasons that I'm here. And she never let go. And so even though her grades weren't as high as some other people, I was convinced that you know, this person, because of her spirit, because of her commitment to service, I am convinced that she will make a fantastic jag. She was eventually selected for jag. Things didn't always go well. December 2010, I was on a plane. Steve Redmond, my, my special assistant, an army officer, and I were on our way up to Boston. I believe this was the week between Christmas and New Year's. And I was sitting next to a young man that reminded me so much of that first image, gun ho. He, I was reading something, and we got into a conversation. He found out I was in the military, and he was an undergrad. But he was convinced that his purpose in life is to be a Navy SEAL. And he was wondering, hey, sir, is there anything you can help me? <laughs> Any way that you can help me to achieve my vision of being a Navy SEAL? And we talked about it, and actually, I, I was able to put him in contact with some people that I knew. And it was an inspiring conversation. This person's name was Jojo, Jojo Booker. I was on my way to Chocho Lassie's funeral. Chocho had been deployed to Guantanamo, to Iraq had some rough spots during her JAG career. But after some jobs, after getting out, was jobless. Had received notices that she was going to be losing her home soon. And one day on mid-December, and I remember it well because it was my birthday, she decided to take her own life. That's what we have to make a difference in. We have to make a difference. This nation has to make a difference. So that's why I love my job. Because I'm in a position to sometimes talk to folks like yourselves, who can talk to other people, perhaps put some policies in place, influence some policies to make a difference. We have three priorities at VA. Improving access, that includes improving the transition from DOD to being a civilian. We've got a lot of work to do. The largest cohort or largest group of veterans, the fastest growing group, are women veterans. So making VA more woman friendly, we have to do that. 
In addition to that, we have to end homelessness among veterans. The secretary has put a line in the sand and said, look, I want to end homelessness among veterans by 2015. Another reason that I love my job. One day in a meeting, he talked about this. You know, making a claim like you want to end homelessness by 2015, that is not Washington speak. Washington speak is, I want to substantially reduce homelessness. Not, I want to end it. You have to be accountable for a statement like that. But he said this, I would much rather be accused of trying to go for a bridge too far and not succeeding than being in this position and, <laughs> and not going far enough. I love my job. What can lawyers do? When you look at the unmet needs of veterans, homeless veterans. In the top 10, there are at least three expressly legal issues in that top 10. Folks on the street are saying that they need our help with respect to child support issues. They need our help with respect to clearing uh, fines and warrants for people that have been involved in the criminal justice system. Some need our help with respect to restoring their driver's license. Doesn't take a whole lot of work. You know, there are great organizations that do work in terms of helping veterans to file their, discharge, their disability claims. And lawyers are needed on the appellate side of that. But there's a lot of work that can be done that doesn't take a whole, lot of, a whole lot of preparation. Let me close with this. One of my, uh, one of my teammates, uh, the last member of uh, the senior leadership team at VA to come in is uh, General Allison Hickey. She's the Undersecretary for Benefits. She was my classmate at the Air Force Academy, one of the first women uh, graduates. I had the, the great privilege of of being a 1980 Air Force Academy graduate, so that was the first class with women. And last year I had an opportunity to go to Allison's swearing in. And she used a, a story at that about the importance of making a difference that I've also used. So even though we hadn't spent a lot of time, I found it so interesting that we shared this in common. Let, let me just share it. And if you've heard it before, it won't hurt you to hear it again. It's a story by Lauren Isley, and it talks about an, an old man who, who liked to go walking along the beach. And so off, off in the distance, early in the morning, he sees a figure, and it looks like this figure is actually out there dancing. He says, wow, that's interesting. So as he gets closer, he finds out, no, this person isn't dancing. What's, what's really happening is the person is bending down, seem to be pin, picking something up, and tossing it into the ocean. And so he approaches and he asks, uh, what, what are you doing? Well, you see the tide came in and the sun's getting ready to come up and there's starfish all up and down the beach. And so I'm tossing them back in because if the sun comes up, they'll die. So the older man, showing, displaying his wisdom, said, look. You're wasting their, your time. There's miles of beach, and there's starfish all along the way. With that, the young person reached down, picked up another starfish, and tossed it into the ocean, and said, I made a difference for that one. We can all make a difference. There are many opportunities, and I encourage you to do it would be it with respect to direct provision of services or in some other manner. Just finally, 2008, a judge up in Buffalo, New York, who'd been a veteran of, of uh, not the military, but of drug treatment courts. 
he had an idea. He said, I see a lot of veterans that come before me. What would happen if I had a special docket just for veterans that are involved in, in this system? And he ended up researching it and developing the nation's first veterans treatment court, which is a merger between drug treatment courts and mental health treatment courts, which places an emphasis on treatment first. That was 2008. Today, there are nearly 100 of these courts spread out all over the country. Why? Because one person made a difference. Thanks. We have microphones. We don't have microphones. We do have one. Thanks, Mike. Any questions for Will? Since I I got out in November, since I got out in November, my healthcare transferred to the VA. What I didn't talk about in my last piece was I had six combat deployments, not counting the two years I was in Korea. So a lot of the aches and pains that I had in the military are being handled thankfully and graciously by um, the VA in Baltimore. One of the things that came out of that was the OEF, OIF combat advocates. Now, I don't know if anyone, first, one thing I didn't know was that we were, had the access to the VA that we would have as active duty members not retiring. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the OEF, o, OIF combat advocates have been crucial in helping me continue my care. So my question to you would be, where is the future for that process so the combat advocates know how to help veterans in the future. And the combat advocates are at VA? Yes, sir. I think the VA is a decentralized system, the VA healthcare system. What a lot of people don't know, VA is the nation's largest healthcare system, 156 medical centers, 798 community-based outpatient clinics. Uh, the majority of the nation's doctors receive some type of training through uh, VA hospitals. And so a huge system, and as Phil said, the nation's second largest um, cab cabinet level uh, agency. So huge in institution. Secretary Shinseki uh, considers it, you look at the dollar spent, it's equivalent to a Fortune 15 business in, in, in this nation. So all of that, a lot of emphasis is being placed on taking care of the Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom of uh, Veteran. And we're looking at how we can serve them, them better over, over time. Major initiative, electronic uh, record, so that we don't, we don't hear these stories about, wow, those medical records were lost. And so we want a virtual electronic lifetime record. And that's one of the top priorities that, that we have right now, working with DOD to create this, um, this uh, re record. Another question in the back. Uh, yeah, uh, General Council, John, thank you so much. I just want to make one comment. And just as an appreciation for what the VA is, is doing. Um, flying out to Miramar about a month ago, and uh, wheeled behind me was a baby faced 19 or 20 year old um, in a wheelchair, triple amputee. And I could tell a lot of people were very uncomfortable kind of locking eyes with him just because how do you, how do you deal with someone who has experienced that kind of loss? So, I asked him, I said, were you in the service? And he said, yes, Marine Corps. And I just said, well, many, many people may not know what you have experienced or have done for your country, but many, many people are grateful. If anyone here has been in the Pentagon when the wounded warriors are welcome, it is the thundering applause that is there to, to let these people know their, the gratitude of the nation. But the VA is there when that applause dies down. And when you talk about the courage, that these young men and women have got to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we talk about courage about losing your job, and these people need the courage to make each and every day the best it possibly can be. So what the VA is planning to do, it's, uh, uh, I, I think I salute you, and I just thank you very much for your passion. Thank you. In order to, to keep us on schedule, um, I'm going to invite you to a break in just a minute. Uh, some of you do not know that many law schools here at Duke and Raymond's Law School over at North Carolina Central University have clinics that 
have students that work with local attorneys to help the veterans file claims. And, and it's a burgeoning sort of movement within the country. Uh, and, and that's something that adds to this whole complex issue that Will's talked about as far as taking care of those who have served and served their country well. And, and speaking of that, Will, I thank you for your service. I thank you for your passion in your job. God bless. Seriously, it's real privilege to have had the honor of serving with somebody like that. that. That was really, really tremendous. There's only one thing I didn't like about it, Will. <laughs> I got to follow it. I used to, when I first came on active duty, I stutter a lot. And uh, I used to, de I developed this thing with, with uh, during courts martial, I did this voir dire where I used to ask people, would you hold it against the government because I stuttered? And of course, the reaction is, oh my God, of course we want, you know, everything else. And uh, it went on, I stuttered less, then I had to put on the stutter to try to get <laughs> <laughs> But let me tell you something, in life, you know, you, don't, you can't follow a Will Gunn. You can only look at him as, as a, someone to try to emulate and his tremendous career. And I gotta thank you, really, from my bottom of my heart. I know how busy you are. You came down here, you did this for us. It means you, you're making a difference. Um, one of the things that people have been pestering me about, I've been getting all these questions like, Charlie, how can we help the center? What can we do for the center? What can, how, can, how can we be part of the center? And fortunately, you know, we made up a, a little sheet that I think people are going to hand you as, as you leave uh, to go on the break. Oh, wait a second. That was in my dream. Those people were pestering me. <laughs> let's, try to make that, let's try to make that a reality. <laughs> one other thing. Uh, one of our great young students, Michelle Wong, has been working the CLE. And if you haven't signed up for CLE, I understand you just for North Carolina, you just have to sign up once, but please don't walk away having forgot, forgotten about that. Let's take a break and come back at exactly 1.15 for this time, you're all the panel. You're all the panel. The ethics is going to be very interactive. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.